I'll start off by saying hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelin Amar. I am so, so happy to have you all uh, join me on, on this midweek. Um, I want to also uh, sh uh, talk about the library of resources. Notice that we filled up the library of resources of a lot of content from uh, other teachers' suggestion, so you could have access to that also. Uh, we would like to start off today by just uh, talking to, uh, to just mentioning uh, if there's any news and also to present to you all the resources that you have access to. Uh, of course, uh, our, our very own uh, wonderful Barbara is here to, to report to us uh, any news from, uh, from BIM. So uh, Barbara, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Michelin. Okay, for BIM, there's going to be two new exams. A 4059 version C is being worked on with the French sector right now. The theory is finished. The practical is almost finished. Once it's finished, it will be translated. So I hope to get it in in January, February. And also there's a 4060, it'll be a version D that is being worked on by the French sector. And it also, the theory is finished. It's just the practical they're working on. And I hope to get that maybe February or March. So two new exams should be coming from BIM uh, in the new year. If there are any questions, uh, I've left my email, well, I can answer them now, or I've left my email in the chat. And I think Richard has put in, uh, I'd like you to send any feedback. So if you notice any mistakes, or improvements for the exam that you would like, please send in your feedback. And Richard, I believe, is going to add the, yeah, he's added the feedback in the chat already. Or you can always contact me. So are there any questions? Uh, what about the biology exam? Is it on the horizon? <laughs> I'm sorry, Barbara. <laughs> yeah, no, because we were at the meeting yesterday. Well, the biology, no, the prototype is not out yet. And it's my understanding from uh, Michelin too that it's finished in French. This is the ministry that does the prototype, but it's being sent to translation and there's a bit of a delay in translation. And the ministry will not produce the exam until it's ready in French and in English at the same time. Once the prototype is out, hopefully in the new year, then we can start working on a version B. And if you have any biology exams that you work, have, are using in your sector, and they are confidential, meaning that you haven't shared them with other centers, and that you haven't shared them with your students, and they're kept in confidential, they're kept reserved, then you can send them to me once the prototype is out and we could have a version B. If not in the new year, once the prototype is out, we'll start working on the biology. I hope that answers your question, Michelin. For sure. So uh, just to let you know that we might we might have some local exam developed, but uh, I guess uh, Michelle had her finger up. You had a question, Michelle? So you said, sorry, you said the ministry is going to be putting out a prototype for the bio? It will. Yes. yes. So this isn't BIM or anything. This is the ministry. Yeah, the ministry. They do oh. a version A. Yes, yes. And I, then we do B, C, D. Right. I was wondering about that. So how come it took them so long from when <laughs> it, this, started, this came out, the new curriculum? Okay. All right. No, I just wanted to know. Thank you very much. Michelin? Yes, I will. I will answer that little question here. It's just because just to let you know that we, we didn't have a responsable program for the science for a while. Uh, somebody, somebody was in post, but then I'm, like he went on medical leave and then unfortunately he wasn't there anymore. So the post was vacant for a while. So that delayed everything. And now there is a new responsable the program, uh, Monsieur Félix Malte, who I met, and he's wonderful. And um, that's why we had this conversation with, I had this conversation with him, and he said that he, he recognized uh, the, the necessity to have the biology prototype out ASAP. However, unfortunately, in terms of translation, uh, it's kind of jammed at this moment. And uh, they, they're going to put the proper resources to accelerate the process. So yes, it's behind, <laughs> but but it will come up. 
super, like we say in French. I'm, I'm reusing my jokes, but sorry. Uh, so yeah, so it will be coming out, but like Barbara said, um, BIM will only take over the creation of B version B, C, D only when they have the prototype. But uh, that doesn't stop anybody else to do a local exam if it's um, if it is created to the DEDs and the programs need. So, okay. so yes, unfortunately, and and we also didn't have any responsible de program for the math also. So a lot of our math exams are also on back order if you wanna. But now we do. We have. Two new responsable program this year. We're super happy and super lucky, um, even on the math side. So, uh, so hopefully things gonna start rolling again. Okay, great. Um, anybody, anybody has any question for for Barbara? Yes, Barbara, go ahead. Um, you may you when you mentioned that they were making local in-house exams uh, on the BIM site, we do have a checklist for based on the DED and based on the program, what's to be included in the exam. Uh, that might help. Do you want me to put it in the chat? I'll put the, the link in there. And it's basically just a checklist that covers everything and you can make sure that the exam is balanced both with the practical and the theory. So I'll add that, okay. Thank you so, so much, Barbara, for, for, for joining us and uh, enlightening us on what's coming from BIM. Um, we, uh, we really, really appreciate it. And um, now uh, in terms of another resource, uh, my friend Emily is here from Recitage. So anything new on the horizon, Emily? Uh, nothing to report just yet, um, but... Michelin and I are going to be meeting next week to talk about projects we can work on together. So my dossier is Project RISE, which is all about um, helping teachers to create digital resources for our curriculums for adult learners. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any ideas for science digital resources that you want to create, I'm super happy to chat with you about that. I did briefly is it okay if I do the same thing that I did yesterday, Michelin? Uh, go so, ahead, yes, please. Okay, I briefly wanted to share. I have been playing around with um, digital textbooks. So this is um, based off of CK12, which you might have heard of. They have um, some really cool interactive resources, a little bit like the FET simulations. They have a whole bunch of different simulations that um, you can share with your students for all sorts of science topics uh, and, and courses, but they also have these, what are called flex books. So they're flexible digital textbooks. So they have a whole bunch of ones that are pre-created and I took one of them, their biology one, and I edited it, um, to kind of fit with the bio curriculum. And they have they have ones for like a bunch of different math topics too and other science topics. I started with uh, I started with biology because was, I really loved biology as a student way back when. So they have uh, you can break the book into different parts. So I cut out all the parts in their book that like don't apply to the curriculum that I didn't see in the DED that I didn't see in the program of study. So um, like I created uh, a chapter on genetics and let's see, so I, I pick a part in this book and it tells me I can start you know, reading about this or I have some other ways to learn. So they have like little videos, little interactive things. But what does the textbook look like? So um, it looks like a normal textbook except all the parts that are in green I can hover over them and it'll provide me with a definition, which is pretty cool. There are also um, sometimes different, oh, here's see, like I highlighted this part of the book. I can write myself little notes as well. There's practice associated with um, practice questions, knowledge type practice questions associated with each chapter. Oftentimes they'll have like, so here's a little video that's embedded into it. Sometimes they'll have interactive activities embedded in. 
And for my learners, I can also, so I can assign this to my class. I can share a specific part with my class. Do display settings. This is what I'm looking for here. So for my students who are who have trouble reading, um, I can change the size of the font. I can change the background so that it's a bit, although the yellow there isn't so great. So maybe I'd want to pick a different highlight color. But I can change the background color. I can also change how much space there is in between the lines. So I'll just change that back there. Um, and what's really cool about this is like this, all this text and everything that's in here was already here. But as the teacher, let's say I only want, there's a section in this page that I don't, my students don't need to go into that much detail about blood. I just really kind of want them to know like blood types and the genetics behind blood types, people mixing blood types, whatever. I can cut out different parts of the text. I can add in whatever I want. And so you can really customize it to suit your needs. You can also create, like, let's say there's a part of the curriculum that doesn't exist in this textbook that I was working from. I can create my own pages from scratch and put in whatever I wanted. So like for reproduction, for example, there was a section towards the end about like um, human assisted reproduction. There wasn't anything in the textbook for that. So I played around with, oh, if I'm creating my own page, you know, I can insert links, I can write my own text, I can insert my own images, as long as they're Creative Commons images. Um, yeah, so I thought it was something that was pretty cool um, and like something to supplement to make things um, a little bit more interactive for the, like, maybe you don't need a whole textbook, but maybe like a little section um, that's a concept that students have more trouble with that it could be interesting. So I'll put both of those links in the, uh, the notes so that people can find them. You can add it to your own library, edit at will, because I'm obviously not a biology teacher. So I'm sure there's parts that you don't necessarily need. Emily, if you want, if you don't mind, then we can put it in the resource, uh, the resource table. So like that, uh, I'll show after like where to go if you all the resources up to today, where they're located, so people could go and pick whatever they want. And in case, uh, you know, it's something they're interested in, uh, where they can kind of play with it, you know, especially biology. Now it's coming up. Thank you so much. Now we have also the service called Complementary Service and Assistive Technology this year, which, uh, which we didn't have access to before. So we're super, super happy and lucky to have Avi Spector and Karin Jacques. Uh, Karin is not here, but uh, Avi, uh, Avi, as you may all know, he had a previous hat, which is Reci, uh, Recitage, but now he in his new role, I'll, or he's having a double hat, I'm not sure, so I'll let him speak. I'm, st for <laughs> I'm still with the Reci team. I'm still wearing the Reci hat, just collaborating with the complementary services. So I'll let, I'll let you introduce yourself, Avi. <laughs> it's all good. It's, it's, it's all, anyways. All right, so hello, everyone. Um, this year, what was really great is that um, I have a new mandate around accessibility and assistive tech, like Micheline was talking about. Um, I work very closely with Karine Jacques, who is the French sector, who also works, uh, who works with the English sector, too. Long story short, why I'm here today is I'm going to do a small uh, little presentation around how to make your documents more accessible. And really what I can do to work with you, if, if this is something that's interesting to you, if you wanna make your documents more accessible, um, that's what I'm here for. So if you're not really sure what I'm talking about accessible, we'll talk about that in a moment, but the video will explain that and then there, we'll take you from there. We have two, uh, two uh, Reci people on, yes. So, and Richard, of course. Uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, L'Equipe Shock, uh, just uh, to let you know, it's, uh, it's a service to help also uh, CPs and teachers to, to, for content creation and, and also for, for managing the implementation of, of uh, curriculum in, in your everyday uh, life. So that being said, also we have, like you may know, the Age Resources website where you could have access to all uh, all uh, content related um, 
material that other teachers for the past few years have been uh, kind of sharing in the networks. I don't know if you have, uh, if you had any, anybody had a chance to take a look. Okay, so maybe I'll share my screen. I'll just take you into like a fast, fast, um, you know, uh, uh, overview just to, uh, okay. So let me see here. I won't go. I won't go in detail, but it's just mainly to show you this is the the resources. And of course, when we go to sciences, notice that we developed a lot of um, a lot of resources. Of course, they're not all perfect. This is all teacher shared. Some are better than others, but you know what? The fact that we're sharing among the network, this is amazing. So you you have access to anything you want. I know biology is a new program this year, so you may find nothing or very little. Uh, but it's coming. It's going to come next year. There's a team that uh, that we're putting together to kind of develop uh, local exams and, of course, uh, content. But if in case you want to go like, I don't know, uh, 262, notice over here, this is the format that we're using. Of course, the DED, pretest, topic at a glimpse, teacher contribution, lab activity, and video playlist. Again, please, I invite you to, to add in uh, to add in uh, in the teacher contribution. Uh, it's a Padlet. And all it is, if you want to share something with the network, all you have to do is use that plus sign in the bottom. So if I click on it, you get a window. So you put a topic, the grade, and you could use a handout, a, a picture, a link, uh, anything you want. And all it does, it goes up here for the teachers, uh, for all teachers to, to use if needs to. So there is a, a lot of resources here for your use. It's just, unfortunately, it's taking the time to, to do so. Uh, that's for this. And if I, if I take a look at the video list, also, I know a lot of teachers use a lot of videos in their teaching. So again, if you come across a video that you may like or you may found useful for you, again, oops, sorry. I put one on by mistake. <laughs> okay, so again, the same idea. If you, if you just uh, roll down, you have all the way to physics. So um, you have biology, you have few biology ones. And you have all the way from 59 to physics and chemistry. Yes, uh, Emily. Sorry, yes. I'm like, the Padlet I'm looking at right now looks different, but I see this is the video playlist that has the columns. Yes. The other one doesn't have the columns. Got no. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was for its purpose. Back then, um, when Sonia created it, it was just a wall. So people kind of put whatever they want on, on it. And this one is more like I created. <laughs> so I wanted it a bit more organized in terms of like class. So I will be taking a bit more time and probably cleaning the other one up too. But that means you have to go through every single resource, which uh, it would be amazing <laughs> if I have an extra day or two in the day. <laughs> But uh, yeah, th this is the idea. So notice over here, of course, topic at a glimpse and lab activities. These are all teacher, again, teacher made, a teacher shared. So you're more than welcome to, to download any of them, change them, uh, use them. Uh, some of them are not given by teachers with solutions. So you may have to either make your own solution or probably contact the creator and see if if they have a set of solutions to that and notice over here you'll have a pretest section which is actually password protected and um, while well, mine it's not well because it's already preset that way but you guys will not be able to access the pretest session uh, section without a like the the, the password so again, here we'll give you like a window to all the pretests existing for all the sciences for all levels. So again, notice this section is under development. You may find some relevant, some less. You may look at all of them and, and combine pretests. You're the master of your domain. Again, these are all shared resources by teachers. If you would like to share a pretest that you created, be my guest, please send it to me. Or uh, yeah, don't don't post it in the, in the um, teacher uh, teacher on the teacher wall for pretest. Just send it to me so I could upload it. Okay, so it'll be more uh, protected in case you, well because you're using it in class, right? So that's for this. And the other thing that I would like to bring your attention to, uh, we have a newsletter that I really recommend you should um, subscribe to, and this one is any news 
any news in the network, any ministry, anything in term of content, ministry, uh, uh, partners, information, I recommend you register because you'll get the, uh, the information. And we're usually, we publish like third week in the month. So we get to see if there's any workshop done or, uh, or any resources done available to you, new ones, uh, what's happening in the network that you, so you could stay current. So that's for that. And um, and there's some workshops. So I'll let you I'll let you also um, enjoy the discovery if there's other things you would like to look at. But uh, but in 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 you know in uh, in short, this is what the website is for. And of course, we have access to all our partners on our website. So we have access to the Resi uh, website. We have access to Proceeds website. We have access to all our partners on the website also at the bottom of every page. So if this is something you would like to also consult, you can get to any other website uh, uh, available to you. So that's for this. Um, I would like to also maybe um, let you know that I assisted to the French on the French side uh, where the um, for the après, uh, for the science après cour and uh, we got to have a conversation with the uh, responsable de programme, Monsieur Malte, and he brought a question. He wanted to consult teachers on the idea of uh, memory aids in science. The feeling, the feelings, because there's they're not allowed to have a memory aid at this moment in science. But he was wondering, is, is somebody had suggested that they, it would be useful to have a, a memory aid in science for the science students? And on the French sector, the consensus was they would rather spend their time and energy on a better formula sheet and not necessarily a, a memory aid because they felt that they didn't need it. So I took it upon myself to bring that question to on the English sector to see if you guys feel the same way. Let's For me, back. I always thought it was kind of odd that they could have one in math, but they couldn't have one in science. So I always found that a little strange. So I see that kind of as an argument that yes, there should be one, but I understand what they were saying. Like if they had a better formula sheet, then you wouldn't really need it. And then you wouldn't have to spend necessarily class time helping them get themselves organized and producing one. Um, and this is my first year in adult ed, so I'm not entirely sure of everything that's included, but I know a few times this year, like I've had to check with somebody else when a student asks me, do I need to know this? Or, you know, like for instance, like the solubility rules or polyatomic ions, like they'll ask me, are we, do we have to memorize those or are they going to be given to us? And being new, I, often don't know the answer, so I have to go find out and get back to them. But, um, you know, as long as that kind of stuff is included, then I don't have a problem with them having just a formula sheet and not a memory aid. But if we're kind of trying to be science math similar, then maybe it would be a good idea to have the same rules in both courses. Good point. I, I do have some students who are more of a memory, retention, executive function issue, but, and they would uh, benefit from cheat sheets just because they are at a disadvantage, but they usually have IEP, so I can justify having the cheat sheets for everybody else. I just grill them to death with what I need to remember. <laughs> So I think it's fine. That's fine. And, and you, Latif, in your in your class, uh, in your situation, in your uh, with your student, do you think uh, they'll need it or? Yeah, probably the formula sheet would be more, uh, uh, like, more important that for the student than the cheat sheet because of the, as soon as they go through the actually the topics, is going to write uh, a lot. And because it's everything is it has to summarize, and sometimes you cannot summarize. You know, some situations has to be understood in order to the formulas will be okay, because if he is not able to connect, so need more preparation before the exam, because the exam, as you know, the exam is not uh, uh, the time we we prepare the students for the exam. So, uh, yeah, for. Um, the students who has memory, like uh, 
memory or shortage memory problems. So uh, that we have students like this, but we they spend more time actually to get you know prepared for the exam. But uh, I found it could be okay with math, like in some you know to get some situations. But for science, it's uh, uh, if they understood, it would be fine, it would be okay. Uh, yeah, and that's for uh, yeah, students who. Yeah. Especially for the new program, old program was was like was different than, yeah. For secondary five, uh, uh, it doesn't work for chemistry. Like uh, it works can be like for physics, uh, not, not all topics or no, not all chapters. Some chapters can can be other chapters no. but basically like, uh, basically the formula actually uh, she is the. The one that you know could be more uh, developed, mm. you know, to have be more like you know uh, can cover you know more than than uh, that is in right now in order to um, to replace you know, the cheat sheet. Yeah, I had been thinking the same thing. I teach the bio. Just started this school year, so um, I get that a lot. Uh, and I, I teach the bio and the math. So I see both and, you know, you can tell them memory aids for the math and not the bio. And I mean, I, I'm not too sure, but like with the bio, it's a bit different because there's no formulas. It's just information. So, I mean, I don't know other people's thoughts on that. Like, would it just be giving away too much? But the thing is like, yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I think with the bio, it's a different story because it's just a, like it's information that they should know. I don't, uh... So my question to you may be if we, we, we like just go on that topic specifically, if we start giving them a memory aid where they can write down information, is that going to influence the questions on the exam? Because we know right, right now they could actually ask for like the fine or what is. Yeah, and it's but just right we, there. Yeah, but the thing is, if we're going to start giving them this information, does that mean it's going to be an adjustment to the exams? They cannot ask any more questions in terms of like define this anymore. So, yeah, I think yeah, you're so. Right. I don't know if it's any true. of you ever had open yeah. open book exams, say They're in university, worst. they were often way worse because they were a lot harder because you could have your book open for them. Yeah. So if they're going to kind of go yeah. in that, that route, then yeah. it would be a problem. Yeah. yeah, I kind of agree with that, actually. I mean, for yeah. the chemistry and physics and uh, physical science and stuff, like I can understand with the formulas, but bio is a tricky one. Yeah, but I think even even in science, to think about it, Michelle, it, there's a lot of definitions too, right? Yeah, there is. That's true, and especially on the um, the uh, essential knowledge part. Yeah, they would just have everything right there. That's right. I mean, it's it's just because of the. I know that there's an application aspect to the whole practical and the theory part, so it's not like they can just like just regurgitate. They have to kind of interpret and infer but you're right um for those questions that are just define or multiple choice or whatever whatever it it would be i don't know actually i don't know yeah. go ahead just have had you that think? question <clears throat> yeah thank you i was gonna say my concern was um like memory aids particularly in science and honestly even a little bit in math is there great for good students but for your middle and low students they often do them a bit of a disservice because they they were almost like they I don't know how to say this correctly right because everyone's like oh well you can just look anything up on google or you can always just look anything up but you really can't I mean if you don't know how to solve a problem, if you don't know about completing the square, if you don't know what these things are, you can't look them up, right? And I sometimes find the idea of memory aids that, like I said, it's fine for the very good students because they're honestly that type of good student uh, usually has an, an inherent uh, facility with memorizing, right? They do something three times and then they can remember it forever. For the students that don't do that, they 
almost it's almost like they like oh well i'll have a memory aid so i don't need to remember anything and then they don't practice and now they really can't remember anything because memory is a skill like any other right if you don't practice you're bad at remembering things you want to get better at remembering things practice remembering things um I mean, that's if you go look at any of the people who do memory contests, like the memory Olympics and all that stuff, anyone in this room could win those uh, using a few basic tricks and practicing it. So that that I'm always sort of torn that way, because I know we're always like, oh, well, you know, we don't want our students to just be doing that base level. We want them to be doing that higher level thinking. But at some point, you, you got to build the bottom of the pyramid or it falls down. I find this is super interesting because in my classes, when I when I taught also science, I used to do these exercises where I used to tell them, okay, you just did X amount of uh, chapters. Now let's go back to every chapter and write down like a sentence or two of what you remember of it. So I know my strong ones were able to put it in point form. Oh, this is the idea. This is the idea. But the weaker ones was like rewriting all their notes. Everything. So you're walking into exams, like really with memory, like not walking to, but the, I used to allow it to the pretest just to help them out, the one who, who have difficulty. And they, they used to like just spend time just reading <laughs> or, or not looking at it at all because knowingly that they don't know. But for our students who do have IEP, this is not in this category, by the way, because IEP, they, they have other accommodation for them. But we're talking about the regular kids who don't necessarily have uh, IEPs where there's no accommodation for them. So I don't know. I, I might agree with you, Helen, on that one. It's If we want also to have easier questions in the general knowledge one, the, 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 the essential knowledge portion also, you know, we may not do with the memory aid yeah yeah just on that topic of um you know like breaking it up into chunks Nishman, like i think some students really struggle to see the forest for the trees like they they see everything and then they can't pick out the pieces that are important and i like that idea of after each chapter the student has to do some kind of synthesis activity to pick out the important pieces from the chapter so that then by the end they have that even if they're not going to use it for the exam they have this is everything that I've learned in this course not like everything I wrote down for this course in my notebook but here are the most important things and that's like um that's not something that we might focus on as like subject specific teachers. It's more like a study strategy. Um, yeah, Helen, like having your students do concept maps, that kind of thing, those kinds of um, like explicit review activities where students are really asked to, out of everything that you've learned, what are the takeaways that you need, but like with that teacher support to help the, the more the str struggling students who like really can't see. I was gonna say, I straight important. up, in all of my science levels, including physics, have found that I have to teach, explicitly teach how to study. And I have a handout that's like, okay, this is how you do flip cards to be effective. This is how you do Cornell notes to do be effective. This is how you do a concept map to be effective. Try the three types, use the one that works for you. And um, I guess that's sort of, like I said, that's part of my issue where like, I'm really uncomfortable with memory aids just um because i'm not particularly old school <laughs> i don't think i am <laughs> right but like there's just you know what like it's like when you're at that party right and if you're you're trying to remember who's in that film and somebody knows versus everybody has to google the bloody thing right like which one's so much faster and then you just start adding up that 10 minutes all the times that you had to google something instead of actually knowing it's just it's this huge amount of time in your life that you're not spending like doing stuff so I, I i just you know promoting that just seems so odd to me just not even in science not even as an educational thing right 
I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad to hear that, um, that it, we're on the same page from the French sector and the English sector that we feel like, uh, I don't know, I mean, obviously, memory aid has its purpose in terms of studying and gathering ideas and concepts, like, like you, you're saying, like study, not only synthesizing, helping them, like, kind of, you know, uh, I guess, study the subject, because we, we all know our students have a lot of uh, gaps and learning how to study and synthesizing is one of them, right? So yeah, and and the fact of, of almost having that, oh, something that I could, I don't need to remember because I have the, another tool, it's kind of take away, takes away from the learning itself, right? I think, uh, again, but I don't know. I mean, every level is different. This, this, it has good sides and bad sides, like everything. But uh, anyways, I know from the on the French side, when uh, when the response, Monsieur Malte talked about it, he did not completely disregard the idea of a memory aid. He just tabled it. He put it aside, and they were planning on focusing more on the formal issues. So that was like the the, the conversation. That's where the conversation went. But that doesn't mean that they kind of say, oh, absolutely not. It's still there. It's just it's not going to be a priority for what's coming up. So uh, so that, that was one of the conversation we had uh, on the French side. Um, another thing I wanted to bring to your attention, um, actually point number two, which is uh, we're able to find, I got a, a notice um, on, on FET with new simulation, but I would like to share my screen with you again just to show you this is another set of resources that I thought as a teacher I would really appreciate uh hold on over here okay so notice over here sorry I'm just gonna move you guys because I don't like to look at myself when I talk so uh, notice over here these are all I I put together a list of uh, simulation for the science courses of course some simulation can be used in many uh, courses, but these uh, that I was able to kind of uh, pick up and uh, put together with the uh, with the course that I think this might help, you know, uh, either as a review, either as a, as like a, as an activity or a support activity to the, the to the content. So let's take a look. For example, I don't know. I found a couple of them pretty interesting. So let's say, for example, if we take a look at the greenhouse gases. What I found interesting is it's a simulation, of course, interactive, but uh, notice over here, um, you could have, um, of course, you have, sorry, you have the sunlight, you could increase uh, the concentration, lots, uh, very little, and notice this is what's happening. Do you want to have a cloud added? Uh, if I want to add a cloud, look what happens. Uh, the temperature in terms of energy balance. So it's a pretty, pretty neat um, assimilation that, 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 you could, um, that you could accompany what you teach in class and sometimes just as a visual, right? So if we take a look at another one it's like over here, which I thought super interesting, I know in our previous meeting, balancing equation was a big issue, right? And notice something like that, like this, this new setup, you have teaching resources, activity interest, like you have a lot of stuff that you could use, uh, handout accompanying these simulation. So I thought it was such a neat uh, simulation to, to, to use, like, if let's say I increase here and it shows you like a visual of, of if it's right or not. And if it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, you could play with it the way you would like, you know, separate with water, you know, combust methane. So these are all little activities that you could do. So you could add, let's say balances. So if you want a visual support, you know, so you say, look, it's not for somebody who has have difficulties. This is a super interesting way to kind of visually show, oh, I need to increase. And look, it's, it's just getting worse, or I decrease, you know, or I increase, but here I have to, you know, maybe decrease, whatever. The whole idea is to have this balanced, you know, and then to play with it, but not only in terms of a formula, but also whatever method the student would like to, you know, play with and again this is just a, and notice this way also you could have it in term of uh, 
of, of a formula like. So I, I just thought this is a super interesting, uh, super interesting uh, activity simulation that could help in the, the teaching of these difficult topics to some of us. And again, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, going to go through all of them, but please, uh, if you have a moment uh, and take a look at this, if you use any of them and you find the course doesn't make sense, you can adjust it. You can just say, no, I use it for this other course, like greenhouse gases, I use it mainly for 62, but you might have a recurrent, maybe if you want to reconnect it to 64 when you're talking about pollution and whatever. So anyways, or bring it back in chemistry if you're talking specifically about effect of contamination, whatever it is. So I thought this, this, uh, this resource, this set of resources uh, would be useful for teachers. And um, if you find other simulation that you would that you came across that you you find that might be useful, you're more than welcome to keep on adding to this list. Okay. Yes, uh, Emily. Yeah, I, uh, I signed up for their newsletter last night so that I can get updates. Um, and one thing that I noticed when I was exploring their website is you can actually embed the simulations in your own resources. So if you're using like class notebook, for example, with your students, or you're using um, a Google Doc or whatever, you can, um, actually, can you embed in Google Docs, Abby? I'm not sure. I know you can embed in OneNote. Um, you can like export to Classroom and stuff so that the students don't even necessarily need to be like redirected to their website. You can use them directly in the tools that you're already using, which is cool. And if this is something you would like to maybe work with, like in, in term of, okay, I have a simulation, I would like to make a worksheet that maybe goes with the simulation that to guide your, your student with like to a simulation with a purpose, obviously, this is something we can do if you want together, or we could even like work with the, with Rissi on how to embed this in your own like lesson plans and, and on your things. I, I left at the bottom of this document that I thought was super interesting, humor, right? Like if we're talking about scientists and uh, and what they do. So what, of course, this is the geeky side of me that when I read this, I thought it was super funny because if you know the scientists, what they're known for, you'll see how this is relevant. And this could be almost something like you could give the students and say, okay, why we are like we're passing these comments with these scientists and get them to like figure out who did what and you know anyways this is just uh my geeky side that i thought was fun so um do you guys uh, do you find this a list like that useful do you do you want more do you want me to keep on looking for more uh of this kind of uh material content you guys do you use simulation um sorry uh oh. um is this uh the site the colorado edu is it just chemistry and fit, or is it there's their bio stuff too if there i is, went on it yeah okay. there is there is some bio stuff that i have already put in a list of specialists for itself so we're going to okay. talk about it more oh, okay uh, Michelle. okay yeah okay uh so they they do have bio they have math they have science so they, they really look over like math and science they have other things but this is the section that i look for but this is specifically we pulled them together for like more the sciences that we use right away the other ones like the biology there is a couple that they use but i found other simulation elsewhere too for for bio but i was just wondering do you guys have labs to use simulation in your teaching or it's not something you thought of yeah, Carla. Yeah, we use it sometimes. Like uh, I've used the physics classroom, um, but I like I like the ones that you have. But I, I see it. I use them more just as a supplement. So yes, we do we do like real in person labs, but it's nice to do, to use those as a supplement. Or um, sometimes like when they're you know when the students just reading something from the textbook, it's always you can read something and not have any clue what you just read. But seeing it in action usually helps back up what they read. So I, I do like them. I don't use them as much as I would like to use them. So it's nice when somebody goes and finds them ahead of time for me. It certainly makes me more likely to, to have the time to use them. 
Perfect. Perfect. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad. Uh, well, this is the idea is hopefully we're trying to build a library with more visuals, more hands-on because that's our students uh, probably need multimedia to learn what they need to learn anyways. So uh, having a little video, having a simulation, having more like something they can manipulate sometimes just makes it more interesting. So I'm glad, okay, so I'll keep going uh, with that uh, project, I guess. <laughs> um, I'll give you the floor, Abby, to, to show us something really important uh, and beneficial to all of us. Perfect, thanks, Micheline. So I started talking a little bit about my mandate early on, talking about accessibility and assistive tech. And I kind of want to jump back into that because I think a lot of, there's a lot of confusion around the terminology. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So when I'm talking about making something more accessible, what I'm talking about is ensuring that the document is, let's say a document, that's what we're talking about today, is more readable um, by everyone, whether they have a learning disability or not. Um, sometimes when we talk about access or accessibility, people tend to think, is it online or what? It's not about that. It's really about designing our documents in a way where they're clear, they're legible, they're simple, and it really benefits everyone. And that's really what my mandate is, is, you know, it's a five-year mandate so far, um, it will grow, but really it's about working with different teachers, support teams across the English school board and, and making this kind of a reflex for, um, you know, all our FGA centers or age centers, I should say. Now, one of the things I always like to talk about when I'm talking about accessibility is I keep on repeating this point that I just said that, you know, if you're making something more accessible for someone with a learning disability, it actually ends up being more legible and more readable for those that don't have a learning disability. And I'm going to share a quote with you that was in a recent presentation that I gave, and I think it summarizes it really well. So I'm going to put that up on the screen. I'll just give you a moment to read that. Okay. Powerful. So those are, it is. It's it's from a book I just read, and and I loved it. I had to to put it up on the screen. Um, I it's true. A lot of these things that you know we do every day. I I tend to on my phone. I do voice to text. It's easier than me typing all the time. Um, those were originally features for someone with a disability, but it's now available to everyone. Closed captions, that sort of thing. Okay. But in the context of today, over lunch. We're going to look at documents and what we can do to make, again, those more accessible. And to keep me on track and focused, uh, working with Micheline, what we did is we created a short video. It's only about five minutes long, and it's called um, 15 Accessibility Tips in Five Minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the video. I'm going to share that over the Zoom. We're going to watch it together. And after that, we're going to have a bit of a discussion about um, some of the topics that came up. So. Done. Okay. So I'm also going to enable the closed captions. I'm going to make this full screen. My name is Avi Spector, and this is a short video about creating more accessible documents. When you're making something more accessible, you're trying to ensure that it reaches as wide an audience as possible. And that means our students with learning disabilities. So the neat thing is, is if you make a document more accessible, for those with learning disabilities. In other words, making the document more readable, more digestible, you actually end up making the document more accessible for everyone. So to get this all started, let's take a look at fonts. The thing you need to know is there's two types of fonts. The first type of font is a sans serif font. That means the edges of the fonts are nice and smooth. The other type of font is called a serif font where they're kind of more fancy looking. There's little squiggly bits on the edges of the letters. So which one should you use? A good rule of thumb is you should always use sans serif fonts in your documents. Those are the types of fonts that are smooth and don't look so fancy. And they're a lot more easier to read. So over here, I'm gonna highlight my title. It's a nice squiggly serif font. And I am going to change that over to something a lot more readable, like Arial. 
but I could have chose something like Verdana or Comic Sans, which are also sans serif fonts. Next, I want to change the contrast in the opening paragraph because right now it's a light blue text on a white background. So there you go, I've changed it over to a dark gray to provide more contrast. Next, I'm going to ensure that my font is at least a 12 point font and I'll go bigger if I can. So there you go, I've changed this over to a 12 point font in this particular case. Next, you'll notice that the spacing between my lines is only one space. In order to make this more readable, I'm going to change the spacing to 1.5. So as you can see here, the text has a little bit more room to breathe and now there's more spacing between the lines. Not only does this help make the document more readable for everyone, but it helps those with dyslexia. Changing the spacing between the letters increases readability too. Here, the individual letters are tightly packed together. Whereas in this example, there's more spacing between the letters, therefore increasing legibility. Next, I wanna talk about titles or headings. Typically, you might go into a document and say, okay, this is a title, I'm gonna select this and make that a bigger font. It's not a good practice as screen readers will not announce that as a title to students. So what I'm gonna to do to change that is select my text, and I'm gonna change this over to a title or a different heading. And I'll leave the resulting title left aligned because I want the justification to be the same throughout the document. So now that we've touched on accessibility in regards to formatting of a document, let's talk more about what we can do to make our content more accessible. To keep things simple, you want to ensure that you use short sentences throughout your document. It's also a good idea to avoid using synonyms. For example, if you're using the word buy and purchase throughout your document, you wanna stick with just one and repeat that throughout. In this case here, we're sticking with the word buy. You'll also want to avoid the use of italics, which decrease readability in the document. Be intentional with your use of bold. You'll want to make sure that you're consistent the way you use it. A good suggestion is to ensure that your questions are always bolded in your activities so that the students will be used to that format when they get to the exam. You'll also want to minimize your use of tables. The reason why is that screen readers often have difficulty reading out tables. A better practice is to use bullet point format as seen here. Add page numbers. This will help students navigate the document. And let's talk about URLs or web links. Don't insert long complicated URLs into your documents. It makes it quite difficult to retype if this is printed on a piece of paper. Instead, use a link shortener like a bit.ly, a QR code, or even better, both. It's also a good practice to let the students know how much time it takes to complete the assignment. Now keep in mind, this is an average. It may take the student more or less time to complete, but it's good to have a signpost. Last but not least, let's talk about the appropriate use of images in a document. If the image does not support the text for comprehension purposes, it's better to get rid of it. You want to keep things as minimal and as clear as possible. So this image of the bike and the dog doesn't really help the students. So I'm just going to click on it and delete it. So that's that for now. And those are just some of the basics, but even those few steps will help ensure that your document is a lot more accessible. So just before I open up the discussion around that, let me just bring my window over here. Um, I wanted to just three other points which are not mentioned in that video. That video is really a focus on the why, not the what. Um, it's intentionally designed that way. I didn't want to say, click this, do that, because some people are using Word, some people are using Google Docs, it doesn't matter. It's really about being aware that, you know, we can do these things. And then after that, 
you can look around in whatever if using Office 365 or Google or WordPerfect or whatever you're using uh, to, to implement those, those accessibility um, features. Um, also, not everything in there is an absolute. When we start talking about this uh, and when I start reading research papers and talking to different teachers, um, it's hard to say, you know, students with dyslexia need a green background. Well, no, some, some students might prefer having an orange background or whatnot. So they're really the idea is to be aware of a lot of these things. And if you see a student um, that may be undiagnosed because not all our students are diagnosed with learning disabilities, but they're struggling reading or whatnot, is to suggest some of the things that we've done here, making the font sans serif or you know, putting more spacing between the lines, et cetera, et cetera. And that's that. So I'd like to sort of jump into more of a discussion. There's enough of me talking and um, see what comes out from that. Uh, we have Emily as our first person. Go ahead. But the part about tables, tables are used a lot in science. So is there a better way to organize a table so that it is easier for people to read? I don't expect you to have an answer for this right now because this is like a a uh, like random question. Okay, so I have like a pseudo answer. I believe so, yes. I was looking in my research to see if there's some way to format tables in a different way. So the screen reader there, when I say the screen reader, I'm talking about a piece of software that will read it out. Um, the danger of leaving the tables the way they are now is sometimes that it doesn't know which direction to read them in and it's just a big mess. But I believe there is a way. But in the meantime, if you wanna be absolutely sure, yes, you should use bullet points. So I'm going to Google that and I'm going to tap into my network and I'm going to get an answer for you because I love that question. More effective tables. But in science, a lot of our studies is about tables and stuff. But this is just to, I think, to clear. This is when you're using immersive reader. This is not for like just a display the immersive reader component. So if you don't need the immersive readers, the tables are fine. It's just in case you use an immersive reader, and especially if you're taking a course statistics. I mean, everything is is tables, and 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 science is also half of our our our, our stuff is in, in in tables. So I'm sure there must be some way of maybe programming the immersive reader. But I guess this is a risky question. This is not. A I'll look into it. It's tricky because when you're doing like for me, it's really been a mindset shift for me because I'm making all my I, I love designing things and making things fancy and and I've really gone back to making things basic and it, it's tricky because if you do say I'm just going to use tables and everything and then go back and retool it you won't because you don't have time and there's too much stuff but if you make it accessible from the start then it works I totally hear what everyone's saying here this is science there are tables we cannot avoid them I'm going to look into it so that I I will I'm pretty sure it exists Thank you. Well, I'm going to I'm going to ask another question, Abby. We talked about yeah. immersive readers. I know yeah. this is a can of worms. Maybe we don't want to address oh, right I now. I love can of worms. <laughs> yeah. Uh, immersive readers. I know this is this is probably for for students who, who requires somebody reading to them. And I know this is a good practice sometimes to have uh, to have an immersive reader read to you the problems or part of the learning, I guess. Um, is I know you're probably gonna have maybe it's not fair to put you on the spot like that, but no, maybe something spot, something do you recommend like how we can use immersive reader for like as an option for our students? Like uh, if you have a student who has difficulty reading, you know. So again, I'm gonna go with that all approach. Um, I was speaking to a consultant from the youth sector. If we just say we're only using immersive reader for the struggling student that could stigmatize that particular student. So what you can do is, and I know some, and some of us are teaching individualized classes, but you can say, hey, everyone stop. I wanna show you a piece of software that will help everyone. And what I can do, like even in this short amount of time, I know we have five minutes left, but um, I would like to show really quickly when we're talking about Immersive Reader. So Immersive Reader, what it is, it's actually something that's built into Microsoft Word. And I believe most of us, Michelle, you guys are, are micro, your Office 365, Ellen, Carla, I'm not sure, but most of us are Microsoft Words, right? Yes, thumbs up. 
Cool. All right. So this is just a typical Word document. And let's say you have a student, you've given them a Word document or they're working in a Word document. What they do is they click on view, they go inside Immersive Reader, and this is something you can show to the whole class. And when I do that, what it does is it takes my document and right now it's, well, I've it made it really simplified and cluttered free. But if you notice over here, there's three different columns. Like for example, the text preferences. I can make the size of the text bigger. I can increase the spacing. I can change the font to something like Calibri or Comic Sans, or even remember I talked about different colors. So if you have students who prefer to read on a different color background. And what this does is it really does make the document more accessible. Now, I wanna say one other thing because I'm losing my train of thought here. It can be beneficial for everyone, not just those with learning disabilities. Let's say I'm um, taking, I'm, I'm French mother tongue. And I'm in, you know, I'm learning about this stuff. We're learning about, I don't know, something in science. You can actually activate a picture dictionary. Say my, my mother tongue is French and I can click on different words. And if I click, for example, on that, mm -hmm. it's gonna say boom. Beautiful. Okay. So it's giving me a picture dictionary and it doesn't have to be only French. I know I was talking to a student the other day. She said all our students are Persian. Well, there's Persian in here. Okay. So Again, it could be useful for everyone. And when I'm done, I, oh, you can also read it out. Lower St. Lawrence, Saguenay, Lac St. Jean, Abitibi, the North. But see how it's doing it with a weird accent? You can say, well, translate the whole document into French. And if I play it back now. Il y a de beaux endroits à visiter au Québec. Cela comprend la Gaspésie et les îles de la Madeleine. So any document. I just click on back and now I'm back inside my Word document. So again, Micheline, I hope I'm answering your question. You could say to the class, I'm gonna show you a neat little tool. Anyone can use it. Show some of the stuff that I just showed there. I know I just blasted through that in three minutes, but yeah, there you go, immersive reader. And if you're in a Google board, there's something called read and write, but I know we're all Microsoft here. This is super awesome. This is super, super awesome. Thank you very, very much, Avi. PDF gets a little bit more complicated, Helen, not with immersive reader. So you'd have to bring in the PDF, but if PDF has tables and images and all that sort of thing, it's gonna be a mess. So um, there are ways around it, but it's really intended that if you're sharing your documents as Word documents, you can make it more readable. Word document. I think you can bring PDFs into Word and it'll transfer it into a Word doc, you right, Abby? You can, but I, it It'll brings in all the formatting the and the pictures, and then there's letter Ks all over the place. And, you know, it it's not ideal, but there are tools for that. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Like Google Read and Write does it really well, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I'm trying I to just bring just, it down. Go ahead. I was just bringing it up because like, for instance, if I'm sharing something digital with my students, I usually share it in the PDF form so that they can't click in and like delete stuff and change stuff and then be like, but I don't know what the document is anymore. You know what I mean? So you I can always like, share it as like a, a view only link. That way they can't edit it, but they can still see it and, and click on the things and immersive reader it, I think. You, well, you could, I mean, we can try bringing in a PDF. There might be an option that says do not bring in images or you might have to copy and paste it. I was going to say, it's also it's, the other advantage of PDF is of course, because tons of students are working on their phones. Yeah. Yeah. And the downloading and accessing of documents on phones is much smoother for PDFs. So, so that, Helen, that's... I, I do have an answer for you. So Immersive Reader does exist on the phone and there's a way of taking the phone, you just put it over a worksheet, you scan it and it, everything we're just seeing right there. So you, a student can translate it into French, have it read out loud. It doesn't matter if it's a PDF or what, handwritten, no, but any, any printed document, it works well. If I had more time, I would show it. Cool. This is this is definitely uh, a, an invitation for next year. <laughs> we would love would love to have you back for sure on immersive reader because I think this is something, I think uh, it's really really useful in science and math of course, but uh, in sciences because there's so many documents to read also and you know, it, yeah. it, and it's a good habit like to to like you said to normalize. Uh, to normalize all these tools, I think uh, exactly. you know, 
accessibility is about normalization of tools. And thanks, thanks to Richard, which is a great suggestion, which I've been thinking a lot of. Um, I think I'm going to offer this to the English network, um, and it will be available for all subjects. Awesome. And just in an app play core that really goes through immersive reader on Word, on on the phone. And I love all those hard questions. So Helen, I am going to figure out something with PDFs. <laughs> Helen is an A plus for hard questions. I love it. <laughs> you know what the questions are hard is when people say this is a stupid question. I'm like, oh, those are the hard ones. The hard ones I like. Well, regardless, Avi, we will be we will be booking you next year somewhere somehow, uh, with okay. probably a, a list of topics uh, to 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 go over and enlighten us with your expertise. But I want to just extend a huge thanks for you and uh, for Richard and for Emily and for Helen for for being here. And uh, I wish you all a beautiful, beautiful holidays, restful, peaceful. And hopefully we will pick up the science après-cours uh, when we get back in uh, the new year. 